I wonder what happened in those other timelines. I bet there are no other timelines. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the podcast that Darren does not speak its name. Our October episode. <laughs> Today I've got oh this this is exciting. I have got a special guest in the studio. And and you may remember him from back in the days of the other podcast that dares not speak its name, which was an audio fiction magazine. <laughs> uh, I have my old partner Big Anklovich here today. Hey, everybody. Hey, it's nice to see you again. How yeah. have you been? Oh, I've been good. Thanks for having me back. Well, no, thank you for coming in today. I, I it's been a while and things didn't go the way that, that I had hoped, and, and I'm glad that you'd come over here and, and help me on this endeavor. Uh, there's something I've got to do, and then uh, we'll, we'll start the show. Okay. Um, it's uh, not fart into the microphone, is it? Oh, I, we don't do such things on the we podcast that, that dares not speak. Those antics over here? But first, as always, we uh, start the show with the listener mail, and uh, this week's mail comes from listener Seth Williams, and he writes... Dear Rish, I recently listened to the September episode of your podcast. I hope you are raped. Go f*** yourself, Seth Williams. Thank you for uh, the viewer mail, and uh, I look forward to uh, the feedback from the October episode. Okay, so Big, what have you been doing with yourself? And do you have any pictures? So, hey, I don't know if you have ever listened to the show, to my show. <laughs> <laughs> no, I haven't. Well, Sorry. well Sorry. it's uh, not dissimilar to uh, another show that, that also won't be named. Okay. We, uh, we do short stories, and then there's a little bit of conversation, if you can call one talking to oneself oh, okay. conversation. It's a monthly show, and you can find it right here. Cool. Today, we've got a story by an up-and-coming writer, um, E.A. Poe. Oh, cool. I think I've heard of that guy and somewhere. It's called The Telltale Heart. Right on. I think it's based on a famous country song. Oh, cool. So you shelled out a lot of money for the story, I bet, huh? You don't have no idea. Oh, cool. Do you always dress up in skull face every time you record this show, or is it just a special Halloween thing? Usually it's blackface, but <laughs> today, uh, because, yes, Halloween, it's it's sort of supposed to be a costume. Oh, maybe oh, maybe, cool. maybe we'll stick a picture up there for everyone to see. Yeah, that'd be fun. Uh, people reunited at last. <laughs> you reunited, and it feels... So, so good. good. But if you don't mind uh, just sitting through the story, it's a short one. Uh, you may have heard it before, but, uh, you know, bear with me. All right. So, uh, Mr. E.A. Poe, uh, do we know anything about this author? He's from Baltimore, right? I'm sure I don't know. Oh. The Telltale Heart by Edgar Allan Poe. True! Nervous, very, very dreadfully nervous I had been, and am. But why will you say that I am mad? The disease had sharpened my senses, not destroyed, not dulled them. Above all was the sense of hearing acute. I heard all things in the heaven and in the earth. I heard many things in hell. How then am I mad? Hearken, and observe how healthily, how calmly I can tell you the whole story. It is impossible to say how first the idea entered my brain, but, once conceived, it haunted me day and night. Object there was none. Passion there was none. I loved the old man. He had never wronged me. He had never given me insult. For his gold I had no desire. I think it was his eye. Yes, it was this. One of his eyes resembled that of a vulture, a pale blue eye with a film over it. Whenever it fell upon me, my blood ran cold, and so, by degrees, very gradually, I made up my mind to take the life of the old man and thus rid myself of the eye forever. Now this is the point. You fancy me mad. Madmen know nothing. But you should have seen me. You should have seen how wisely I proceeded, with what caution, with what foresight, with what dissimulation I went to work. I was never kinder to the old man than during the whole week before I killed him. And every night about midnight, I turned the latch of his door and opened it, oh, so gently. And then, when I had made an opening sufficient for my head, I put in a dark lantern, all closed, closed so that no light shone out. And then I thrust in my head, 
Oh, you would have laughed to see how cunningly I thrust it in. I moved it slowly, very, very slowly, so that I might not disturb the old man's sleep. It took me an hour to place my whole head within the opening so far that I could see him as he lay upon his bed. Ah! Would a madman have been so wise as this? And then, when my head was well in the room, I undid the lantern cautiously. Oh, so cautiously. Cautiously. For the hinges creaked. I undid it just so much that a single thin ray fell upon the vulture eye. I did this for seven long nights, every night just at midnight, but I found the eye always closed, and so it was impossible to do the work, for it was not the old man who vexed me, but his evil eye. And every morning, when the day broke, I went boldly into the chamber and spoke courageously to him, calling him by name in a hearty tone and inquiring how he had passed the night. So, you see... He would have been a very profound old man indeed to suspect that every night just at twelve I looked in upon him while he slept. Upon the eighth night, I was more than usually cautious in opening the door. A watch's minute hand moves more quickly than did mine. Never before that night had I felt the extent of my own powers, of my sagacity. I could scarcely contain my feelings of triumph. To think that there I was, opening the door little by little, and he not even to dream of my secret deeds or thoughts. I fairly chuckled at the idea, and perhaps he heard me, for he moved on the bed suddenly as if startled. Now, you may think that I drew back, but no. His room was as black as pitch with the thick darkness, for the shutters were closed fastened through fear of robbers, and so I knew that he could not see the opening of the door, and I kept Pushing it on steadily, steadily, I had my head in and was about to open the lantern when my thumb slipped upon the tin fastening and the old man sprang up in the bed, crying out, Who's there? I kept quite still and said nothing. For a whole hour, I did not move a muscle, and in the meantime, I did not hear him lie down. He was still sitting up in the bed, listening just as I have done night after night, hearkening to the death watches in the wall. Presently, I heard a slight groan, <laughs> and I knew it was the groan of mortal terror. It was not a groan of pain or of grief. Oh, no! It was the low, stifled sound that arises from the bottom of the soul when overcharged with awe. I knew the sound well. Many a night, just at midnight, when all the world slept, it has welled up from my own bosom, deepening with its dreadful echo the terrors that distracted me. I say I knew it well. I knew what the old man felt and pitied him, although I chuckled at heart. I knew that he had been lying awake ever since the first slight noise when he had turned in the bed. His fears had been ever since growing upon him. He had been trying to fancy them causeless, but could not. He had been saying to himself, It is nothing but the wind in the chimney. It is only a mouse crossing the floor. Or it is merely a cricket which has made a single chirp. Yes, he has been trying to comfort himself with these suppositions, but he had found all in vain all in vain, because death in approaching him had stalked with his black shadow before him and enveloped the victim. And it was the mournful influence of the unperceived shadow that caused him to feel, although he neither saw nor heard, to feel the presence of my head within the room. When I had waited a long time, very patiently without hearing him lie down, I resolved to open a little very, very little crevice in the lantern. So I opened it. You cannot imagine how stealthily, stealthily, until at length a single dim ray like the thread of a spider shot out from the crevice and fell upon the vulture eye. It was open, wide, wide open, and I grew furious as I gazed upon it. I saw it with perfect distinctness, all a dull blue with a hideous veil over it that chilled the very marrow in my bones. But I could see nothing else of the old man's face or person, for I had directed the ray 
as if by instinct, precisely upon the damned spot. And now, have I not told you that what you mistake for madness is but over-acuteness of the senses? Now, I say, there came to my ears a low, dull, quick sound, such as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I knew that sound well, too. It was the beating of the old man's heart. It increased my fury as the beating of a drum stimulates the soldier into courage. But even yet, I refrained and kept still. I scarcely breathed. I held the lantern motionless. I tried how steadily I could maintain the ray upon the eye. Meantime, the hellish tattoo of the heart increased. It grew quicker and quicker and louder and louder every instant. The old man's terror must have been extreme. It grew louder, I say louder every moment. Do you mark me well? I have told you that I am nervous, so I am. And now, at the dead hour of the night, amid the dreadful silence of that old house, so strange a noise as this excited me to uncontrollable terror. Yet, for some minutes longer I refrained and stood still. But the beating grew louder, louder. I thought the heart might burst. And now a new anxiety seized me. The sound would be heard by a neighbor. The old man's hour had come. Ah! With a loud yell, I threw open the lantern and leaped into the room. Ah! He shrieked once, once only. In an instant, I dragged him to the floor and pulled the heavy bed over him. I then smiled gaily to find the deed so far done. But for many minutes, the heart beat on with a muffled sound. This, however, did not vex me. It would not be heard through the wall. At length, it ceased. The old man was dead. I removed the bed and examined the corpse. Yes, he was stone. Stone dead. I placed my hand upon the heart and held it there many minutes. There was no pulsation. He was stone dead. His eye would trouble me no more. If still... You think me mad. You will think so no longer when I describe the wise precautions I took for the concealment of the body. The night waned, and I worked hastily but in silence. I took up three planks from the flooring of the chamber and deposited all between the scantlings. I then replaced the board so cleverly, so cunningly, that no human eye, not even his, could have detected anything wrong. There was nothing to wash out. No stain of any kind. No blood spot whatever. I had been too wary for that. When I had made an end of these labors, it was four o'clock, still dark as midnight. As the bell sounded the hour, there came a knocking at the street door. I went down to open it with a light heart. For what had I now to fear? There entered three men who introduced themselves with perfect suavity as officers of the police. A shriek had been heard by a neighbor during the night. Suspicion of foul play had been aroused. Information had been lodged at the police office, and they, the officers, had been deputed to search the premises. I smiled. For what had I to fear? I bade the gentleman welcome. The shriek, I said, was my own in a dream. The old man, I mentioned, was absent in the country. I took my visitors all over the house. I bade them search, search well. I led them at length to his chamber. I showed them his treasures, secure, undisturbed. In the enthusiasm of my confidence, I brought chairs into the room and desired them here to rest from their fatigues, while I myself, in the wild audacity of my perfect triumph, placed my own seat upon the very spot beneath which reposed the corpse of the victim. The officers were satisfied. My manner had convinced them. I was singularly at ease. They sat, and while I answered cheerily, they chatted of familiar things. But, ere long, I felt myself getting pale and wished them gone. My head ached, and I fancied a ringing in my ears. But still they sat and still chatted. The ringing became more distinct. I talked more freely to get rid of the feeling. But it continued, and gained definitiveness, until, at length, I found that the noise was not within my ears. No doubt... I now grew very pale, but I talked more fluently and with a heightened voice. Yet the sound increased, and what could I do? It was a low, 
dull, quick sound, much such a sound as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I gasped for breath, and yet the officers heard it not. I talked more quickly, more vehemently, but the noise steadily increased. I arose and argued about trifles in a high key and with violent gesticulations, but the noise steadily increased. Why would they not be gone? I paced the floor to and fro with heavy strides, as if excited to fury by the observations of the men, but the noise steadily increased. Oh, God, what could I do? I foamed, I raved, I swore! I swung the chair upon which I had been sitting, and I grated it upon the boards. But the noise arose over all, and continually increased. It grew louder, 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 and still the men chatted pleasantly and smiled. Was it possible they heard not? Almighty God, no! No! They heard! They suspected! They knew! They were making a mockery of my horror! This I thought, and this I think! But anything was better than this agony. Anything was more tolerable than this derision. I could bear those hypocritical smiles no longer. I felt that I must scream or die. And now, again, hark louder, 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 louder! Villains! I shrieked. Dissemble no more! I admit the deed! Tear up the planks! Here! Here! It is the beating of his hideous heart! All right, and we're back. Uh, once again, if you're just joining us, uh, Big Anklevich is here in the studio. Hey, everybody. And he's from the, uh, the, the, the douche, the douche, Eliza Dushku fan, uh, what is it? Yes, Eliza Dushku fan club. I actually started that. Yeah, yeah I can't blame you. So, uh, She's uh, uh, even uh, more beautiful in person, I've heard. I'm jealous that you know that. <laughs> we used to have a show together. How is that show of yours going? <clears throat> well, you know, actually, it's it's been a little bit of a disaster for the last... Uh, Eight months or so. Pretty much uh, since the last time you were on the show, we've, we've had a lot of problems. Once we got rid of you, <laughs> one of our, our listeners volunteered. We had a, To be a co-host. To be the co-host, right. Yeah, he came on and he joined me on the show. His name was Costin Van Dongen. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. For, I thought you had said Costin Van Dongen. <laughs> I'm sorry. I apologize. I'll, I'll make sure to cut that out. And so anyways, Costin was helping me with the show. But then uh, one day uh, on the way home from recording, somebody had strung a string of dental floss across the road. Some kind of, you know. As a prank or something. Right, as a prank. And he was beheaded. Oh, and was he on a motorcycle? No. He was in a car. He was actually driving a semi. Yeah. That seems unlikely, but that's it was, horrible, man. It was pretty unfortunate, Yeah. Things uh, kind of took a turn for the worse there. I had to do shows uh, by myself for a while. Oh, and I, I understand that announcer man took his life. Yes. Yeah, he did. After he was uh, abducted by aliens and had that whole anal probing thing go on, he was unable to really come to terms with it. And yeah, you know. Well, no, I, I, if for our non-American listener, sir, ever since that huge hit Mars Needs Moms came out, there have been alien abductions all across the, the Midwest of the United States. And uh, apparently just the aliens were a, a huge fan. Well, as everyone of Mars Needs Moms. I, I'd say that movie changed the face of film forever. Yeah, it really did. It's amazing. Uh, but yeah, so, you know, after that, um, kind of the quality slipped a little bit and people really missed Announcer Man. And, and uh, we didn't get very many donations. And so pretty soon we had to uh, disassemble... Uh, ROA.OT and sell them off for spare parts to keep the show going. And uh, yeah, finally... Uh, wow, I'm not uh, at all sad about hearing that. <laughs> finally, yeah, last last week we just decided it was time to sign off. Hmm. Well, so, what, what, has that episode already aired? Uh, yeah. Uh, I didn't get any downloads, but yeah, it aired. Well, hey, the, the, we'll use this opportunity to plug it. What was the last story that you ran on, on, the, on, on your podcast? The story was called uh, The Notorious B.I.G. and the End of the World by Matt Carvin. Yeah, so it's out there. Everybody can go check it out, you know, like anybody's going to. Well, hey, as you know, President Kerry has said that in, uh, in response to those landslides and snowstorms in Arizona, 
Halloween will be on the 2nd of November this year. Really? And so everybody's got the extra two days in preparation. You could do a heck of a lot worse than to go to his website and download that, that episode, listen to it, and, uh, and bid farewell to a, once great, I, to a consistently great podcast. Right. So yeah, we're here, and it's, um, what is it, the 2nd now? Gosh, that's weird. The extra two days, I, I got the dates all mixed up in my head. I still haven't even run out and gotten my uh, slutty uh, Lucille Ball costume that I was going to wear this year. 114 years old, Lucille Ball, and still attractive. Yeah. Kind of amazing as she keeps on trucking on that. And yet, George Burns was taken so young. Anyhow, in honor of Halloween, I just thought it would be cool to have uh, you here and we could talk a little bit about what Halloween means to us. Was Halloween a big deal for you growing up? It was. It's one of those things. Everybody loves getting candy. Everybody loves Raymond. That too. But uh, you know how every kid is. They just want to get out there and get their hands on tons and tons on of candy. Titties, yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yes. I'll make sure to snip that little part as I wish you had been. <laughs> as you should have been. It's kind of funny because every kid is just so insane to get all this candy. And they'll go out and they'll walk every last street in the neighborhood i don't know if you were like i was when i was a kid but i was out until like 10 there was always the last few houses where i'd go to where people are just like people are still trick-or-treating you guys are still out you know they're always surprised that i'm still ringing their doorbell and half the time they would say didn't you knock up my daughter i remember they they (laughs) right right. no matter what kind of costume yeah that is tough to be so good looking. But um, since I've become an adult, you, you realize, you know, you spent hours doing this and you come home with a sack full of candy and the candy that you've got in there probably would cost you mm, 10 bucks tops to go and buy at the store. The amount of work you do to get that candy, you ought to be paid 30, 40 bucks at least. So this is in today's dollars you're talking about. In today's dollars. Because as a kid, I'm sure my whole sack of candy, even, you know, shivering in the cold, trying to go to as many houses as possible, wouldn't have amounted to $4. Right, right. I was talking in today's dollars. Yeah, I I was accounting for inflation because I noticed the uh, discrepancy when when I became an adult and was able to go out and buy the candy to hand out the kids and think, man... This big bowl full of candy was 10 bucks, probably. I used to spend all night trying to get this candy. It's just crazy. Was Halloween a big deal for you as a kid? I'm assuming it must be because here you are in Skullface for the occasion. Yeah, huge, huge deal from as young as I can remember. I was a weird kid, as you can guess. And just really into monsters, really into horror at Halloween. It was one of those... It was something that I looked forward to the whole year, the way that, you know, most kids on my block looked forward to Veterans Day or Rosh Hashanah or, you know, or um, Scott Baio's birthday. Yeah, Mm -hmm. the the, the national observances. I would pick out what I was going to be, you know, months in advance. Did you change your mind like 10 times along the way? No, no, not, not usually. You were a focused child. See, my daughter this year has already changed through, I think, three ideas. Before she settled on being Storm Shadow. Although she doesn't realize she's being Storm Shadow. She's just going to be a white ninja. Racism. Hey, Storm Shadow was Asian after all. Come on. So yellow ninja, sir. (laughs) Oh, sorry. You know, the the big costume this year is uh, obviously Brad Pitt's character from the the Mexican trilogy. Even adjusting for inflation, that Gore Verbinski Mexican trilogy, uh, highest grossing film series of all time. Just pretty awesome. And and I heard the fourth one, they're going ahead without Verbinski. Whoa, really? Thinking that Julia Roberts and uh, and Brad Pitt are are enough Mm -hmm. to carry that fourth one. Of course, you know. It's going to be in 1D because that's all the rage right now. But uh, I don't know why I'm doing this. Oh, silly horse. bye. The fake Sean Connery, will you cut out all that stuff for me, please? No. All right. Oh, that's like what the... your mother was saying last night. I like fake Sean Connery. I wish he'd been on our show more often. Yeah, well, I had to take my intellectual property with me. <laughs> <laughs> our show might still be going if we had fake Sean Connery around. So, so yeah, just uh, I, I still love Halloween. It's been really great to uh, see it through the eyes of of the children that I have taken the eyes of, and in a jar. 
<laughs> on my shelf. No, uh, my my sister just hold them up in front of your eyes. Yeah. Oh, it's so blurry. Yes, it's everything looks like candy canes and tall people. But uh, I've been hanging out out a lot with my sister's kid, my nephew, because pretty much he's the only person that will tolerate you. Yeah, most people are just they don't like my immaturity. And, they just know uh, better. We were driving around somewhere, and, and they they had a big billboard for uh, for that all nude Sarah Jessica Parker review that's coming out that we're all excited oh, about. Oh yeah. Uh, no, it was the, oh, there. There was a big billboard for like a haunted house kind of thing they do for charity around here, and uh, I was asking him, you know, are you excited about Halloween? And he didn't really seem to be. And it bummed me out because you know my life revolved around Halloween as a little boy, and it still sort of does. And then I was like, you don't get excited. You don't think that'll be cool to be able to dress up in a costume and go to houses and get candy. And he said, that's what Halloween is. Yeah, I like that. And that to me was really funny. That he, he didn't know what the word was, but he did remember getting the candy. Sure remembered the experience. That's what your mother was saying, Anklovich. Oh, yeah, I really like this fake Sean Connery. He's good. That's what your grandmother said. <laughs> Hey, stop it. Come on, that joke is, is tired. Yes, well, your little sister was tired when I had my way with her. That's probably true. She is a bit of a whore. Speaking of which, I was thinking of the time that you and I, back in the days of that old podcast, right at the end of the Al Gore presidency, you and I went to a costume shop together and we were looking for costumes for us. And we found all of these just like little Bo Peep, Peacemaker, uh, a little Red Riding Hood, <laughs> Goldilocks... All sorts, uh, all sorts yeah. of things, but they, they were really low cut, short skirts, lots leggy. Um, there's a word for it. They 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 were kind of revealing. They were they, uh, sure there's kind of maybe slutty. Exactly. There you go. That's what they were. Like wow, this is this opens up a whole new. You we, I went. That's what Halloween is. Hi, oh, I, I like, like that. that. <laughs> Indeed, you did. And you went, wow, that's cool. He doesn't know what Halloween is, but he remembers the experience. <laughs> this guy's my kind of chap. You should have him on here more often, Outfield, instead of yourself. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Sean. Fake yeah. Sean. Please call me fake Sir Sean. All right. Uh, just in honor of that experience that we had, I thought it would be cool to to talk about our our top... The top 13 there we go. favorite Halloween costumes that we've seen this year. Just, you give one and I'll give one. And okay. That sounds good. Well, uh, the first one that I saw this year, I saw a picture of it just floating around on Facebook. Um, Nobody uses Facebook anymore. It's all MySpace now. Just, just a heads up if you want to seem cool. Uh, anyway, go ahead. Okay. Sure. So anyways, yeah, this picture was floating around. It was of a, 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 a slutty dog at-at costume. Okay, I'm visualizing it in my mind. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I saw a slutty Iron Man costume. And it was basically just like a low-cut, cleavage red outfit and Iron Man's mask. You're a big comic book reading guy. You, you've seen the issue where that character is actually real, right? I have not, sir. It's too bad. That was a good issue. Well, see, in this reality, you read comic books and I don't. Oh. Because I'm too busy having sex. Oh, Damn, <laughs> these alternate realities. Okay, continue, please. You know, that's interesting. I'll see your slutty Iron Man and raise you a slutty Robin. And I'm not talking Robin the bird, although that would probably be a pretty good slutty costume. But there was a slutty Batman and Robin Robin costume, which I guess is actually the costume that the girl from The Dark Knight Returns wore any, or something. Any woman in Dark Knight Returns would have been <laughs> slutty. <laughs> I suppose she would be. It was Frank Miller. I, yeah, that, I like that. Uh, I saw a slutty Freddy Krueger costume. Ooh. It really, really filled out the burns in that hat. <laughs> well, talking about filling out a costume, I saw a slutty Jabba the Hutt costume. <laughs> now that's nice. Yeah. I, I saw a slutty Mother Teresa costume. <laughs> that's in poor taste, lad. Oh, I, I'm, I'm sorry. That is pretty wrong, I'll have to admit. <laughs> now, one that's not in poor taste, for sure, is the slutty Aunt Jemima costume that I saw. Good luck. That's good. You're gonna need it. I saw a slutty California raisin costume. I, I No, I can't even picture that. 
I'll send you the, the JPEG. Oh, okay, cool. The animated GIF. I'll put it in my folder with the rest of them. <laughs> Malfunctioning little twerp. Okay, well, one that I saw was the uh, slutty Jimmy Stewart in Mr. Smith Goes to Washington costume. That was pretty good. And I usually don't swing that way, but, you know. Not a fan of the ladies, are you, Biggie? All right, come on, man. Just leave him alone. All right, I don't like the Sean Connery anymore. Oddly, I I saw a slutty Hulk costume. And he just, his pectorals, I guess, were a little bit more (laughs) defined than normal. Where's pants just a little bit more ripped up it, it was usual. a purple thong Ooh, but it still was shredded a little here and there well you know it's funny because i saw a, a slutty sulu costume like slutty george takei costume. that's right you are a douchebag hey he makes guest appearances on your show too not recently ever since he married megan fox uh he's just been uh, i guess too busy to, to come busy? back on the show yeah very fortunate man, that Mr. Sulu. Yeah. The only other strapping heterosexual male in this reality I'm more jealous of is uh, Neil Patrick Harris. <laughs> I hear you. Very uh, good reality we've got going on here. Yes. Slutty Osama bin Laden costume, I remember seeing. Oh, yes, I can totally see that. Slutty, oh, slutty salacious crumb costume. That was a good oh, one. That's sort of a themed thing. Yeah, yeah it's kind of like... Uh, Salacious Crumb's head on Elle McPherson's body. (laughs) Oh, I'm half-masked as you speak. Thank you. Speaking of which, slutty Margaret Thatcher costume. The the classics never go out of style. Dude, Margaret Thatcher was so hot. It's too bad she was never elected. No, well, thank God, because she found her true calling in lingerie modeling. (laughs) Sorry about that. Speaking of politics, slutty Mayor McCheese costume. Yes, I saw that one, and uh, my mouth hasn't stopped watering. (laughs) You know, one of my favorites, and I see this one year after year after year, it's always a big seller, (laughs) is the slutty Sindel Tawani costume. Excellent. If you get that reference, then you're much nerdier than than me, because I have no idea. No, no idea. (laughs) Uh, and and then I, I would say the number one Halloween costume for this year uh, is the, oh, old standard slutty Anne Frank costume. Ah, uh, yes. One of the best. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't let you say that. That's so wrong. Wow. In this reality, you do the Harvey Firestein. <laughs> no, I don't, actually. Uh, so there's there's our list. I tend not to do very long episodes because you know, I haven't the stamina you do, so... Uh, I think this is all the time we have for today. Okay. But, uh, hey, I would like to thank, once again, my special guest, Big Anklevich, of the late, lamented, I'll just go ahead and say it, the Stoof D podcast. <laughs> you know, it's and, funny. Uh, uh, we did that show for so many years, and you never told me what Stoof D means. And then you were kicked off the show, and... I, well, I, I quit the show, actually. Uh, you know, oh. I, you can't fire me. I quit. Uh, Stoof D is just a, the, the little muscle that makes your eyes... Uh, roll up when you die wow i had no idea yeah it's just right here in the back of between the eyeball and the brain stem and uh, you won't find it in any medical textbooks it's um only people with red hair have them <laughs> anyhow okay thank you uh once again thank you mr poe for sending in your story and thank you big anklevich for showing up today no problem by the way i'm gonna be crashing in your basement well, that's fine. Because my house also burned down this week. It really kind of has been a bad uh, year. Well, that's a bummer. Yeah. Whole family killed in the fire. Well, let's just imagine how much worse they have it in, in alternate realities. Yeah, right definitely. This is probably the darkest timeline of all. <laughs> Some things never change. <laughs> Good night, folks. Thanks for listening. Bye. The podcast that dares not speak its name is a presentation of No Apologies Productions and appears under a Creative Commons Attribution No Derivatives License. My license, as you may remember, is to kill. Good night. Okay, so Big, what have you been doing with yourself? (laughs) I'm sorry, sorry. I was a little caught off guard by this whole thing. So I got the idea of doing this while I was driving. Then when you called and said, we're going to do Telltale Heart, I was like, 
This is exactly what I was going to ask you to do. <laughs> oh my lord, sir! <laughs> oh, we don't, we don't do that kind of Dune Steve type thing here. Holy crap! I just choked on that. Yes. <laughs> I couldn't stop that one. Wow. Someone's got a large mess to clean. <laughs> oh. That was a real spit take. All right. Take two, you shodding hermaphrodite. Uh, do, I, do we need to comment on all of them or any of them? We can comment on some of them if we have a comment to say on them. Okay. Did you want to talk about that one and say with it good? or? Yeah. <laughs> no. By the way, with it is from anachoinosis. Damn. With it is the dog. Ah, I see I'm screwed now. One of those, you can tell me a hundred times and I'll always get it wrong. <laughs> yeah, my first wife could do better than that before I slapped her. Man. I was thinking it would be fun to pretend like this was an alternate timeline oh, of okay. our show. And so it's it's as if we'd never invited you back and it kept on going. <laughs> At some Go point, on. we can. I don't know how we can allude to the fact that this is an alternate timeline. I mean, first, announcer man was raped and killed, and uh, another rape joke. <laughs> <laughs> Should I use something else then? Yeah, I just I was saying announcer man was raped said... is awful. <laughs> what is wrong with you? Besides the obvious. I don't know. What is? Have we ever rejected a Jason Sanford story? No. Have we ever... Wow, that's definitely... Uh, let's try that again, shall we? Who did beachcombing? Well, sunny Sea. Yeah, I used to like to drink Sunny Sea until I found it gave you ass cancer. Oh, that was, sorry, that was Sunny D. One thing has become clear. This is the darkest, most terrible timeline. Enough with the timeline crap, Abed! Old standard slutty Anne Frank costume. Ah, yes. Sean Connery has to say something about how wrong that is. Or should I? Uh, how dare you? Many Germans were killed by Anne Frank. No, I won't do that. That's, that's a... You know. right. do, 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 do. Do, do. Evil Troy and evil Abed. Darkness falls across the land. The midnight hour is close at hand. Creatures crawl in search of blood to terrorize your neighbor. And whosoever shall be found without the soul for getting down must stand and face the hounds of hell and rot inside a corpse's shell. This is embarrassing. Bloody Michael Jackson songs. The foulest stench is in the air. The funk of forty thousand years and grisly ghouls from every tomb are closing in to seal your doom. And though you fight to stay alive, your body starts to shiver. For no mere mortal can resist the evil of the thriller. <laughs>